Okay, please open your Bibles to Mark, please, uh, chapter nine. Mark chapter nine says, and one of the crowd answered him, meaning Jesus, teacher, I brought you my son, possessed with the spirit, which makes him mute. And whenever it seizes him, it slams him into the ground, and he foams at the mouth, he grinds his teeth and stiffens out. I told your disciples to cast it out, and they could not do it. And he answered and said, O oh, unbelieving generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I put up with you? Bring him to me. They brought the boy to him. When he saw him, immediately the spirit threw him into a convulsion and falling to the ground, he began rolling around and foaming at the mouth. And he asked his father, how long has this been happening to him? And he said, from childhood. It has often thrown him both into the fire and into the water to destroy him. But if you can do anything, take pity on us and help us. And Jesus said to him, if you can, all things are possible to him who believes. Immediately the boy's father cried out and said, I do believe, help my unbelief. So in this story, Jesus, uh, of course we know, goes on to uh, heal the uh, demon-possessed boy. But I want us to focus not so much on the healing, um, I want us to focus on the conversation that he has with the anguished father regarding faith, regarding belief. This story illustrates how we arrive at believing something. I mean, believing anything actually, not just you know, religious ideas. How, how we come to actually believe something or other. You see, belief happens when you consider something as true based on a reasonable amount of evidence or proof or facts. I'll repeat it again, that's the definition. Belief happens when you consider something as true based on a reasonable amount of evidence, proof or facts. In this case, the father was pleading for some additional facts from uh, some additional help in order to accept as true the ability of Jesus to heal this boy. Now another way to explain the process of believing is to picture a stream. Imagine there's a stream running and you're on one side of the shore. And on one side of the shore, um, uh, uh, let's call it uh, disbelief. And on the other side of the shore, or the other shore across the stream is belief. And then you know how you've done sometimes out in the woods or whatever, there are rocks, right? There's sometimes stones or a log, something, and you, you kind of use those, you step from one rock to another you know, to get to the other, uh, other side of the stream. So imagine that this stream here and these sides here are belief and disbelief, as I mentioned. One side of the stream is disbelief and the other side is belief and the stones are the facts that help you to cross over. Now, take for example, let's, let's try to use this idea, and uh, let's take for example whether or not you believe in the existence of the country of China, okay? So let's uh, make a little diagram here. So over on one side, you start with disbelief or ignorance, you, know, you just don't know. And then you read a book about China, and it talks about China's history and China's people and so on and so forth, and you start getting some information. Now you've never been to China, but now you've read a book about China. Wow, somebody's reading about China. Well then you take another step and you see some pictures. Somebody you know, has pictures in that book about you know, the Chinese countryside and the main cities and the people and the customs, and you actually begin to see pictures of Chinese people. And then you, you actually meet some people who come from China and they give you more information about their home country. You see where this is going, right? And then you watch TV and there's an actual film about China, filmed in China, using Chinese people. You can see and hear their language. And then you look at the, you, know, you get an atlas out and you look at the map and you see there's my country and wow, over here there's this other country called China. And then you meet somebody that you know, a friend of yours, somebody you trust, who has been to China, and they've come back from China, 
and they're saying, oh, we had a wonderful trip and everything you read about is true and I've seen it and it's great and it's wonderful and it's such an exotic country. And you know what happens next? What happens next is you finally take a step of faith and you accept as true the existence of this country called China. And I know that's a kind of a simple example. Belief is just a, a step, one more step. Why? Because you've had a lot of evidence and you know, pictures and maps and all kinds of information that help you to get to the, to the other side. So the chain of faith and facts serve as stepping stones to bring you from disbelief to belief. And that goes for, for anything. You may not have all the facts. You know, like I said, maybe you've never been to China yourself. But at some point you have enough information to take that final step of faith and accept the proposition as true. Okay, so let's get back to our story, shall we? The father of the boy, if you wish, was kind of halfway across this stream here. I mean, he had come part of the way. You know, he had brought the boy, he had heard about Jesus, and he had heard about you know, that some of the things that he had done to other people, and he took the boy, you know, and he brought them to, and he found where the apostles were and where Jesus was, and he brought them to the apostles, and he put himself forward, and he told his story. But he was kind of halfway, you see. He needed a few more stones, if you wish, before taking that final step. And of course, Jesus provides them by his healing of his boy. Actually, Jesus kind of just carries them across to the other side. So this evening, I'd like to use this kind of chain of faith and facts to show you how we arrive at believing the most basic teaching of our Christian faith, and that is the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Paul, in the book of Romans, says about Jesus who was declared the Son of God with power by the resurrection from the dead. Paul is saying our faith is based on this fact, on this happening. This is the basis for our faith. And so the resurrection is the foundation upon which our faith rests. Without it we have no hope and all of our efforts are in vain. So this is a pretty important part of our religion, the most important part of our religion. Without it, as I say, we have no hope. So let's see how we go from disbelief to belief when it comes to this event. All right, first let's have a little bit of background, a little historical background surrounding Jesus and His resurrection. First of all, we know that He truly existed. You know, Jesus is not some myth or some idea, you know, mythological figure. He is a true historical figure. It's not a fable. We have uh, Pilate's own records indicating that a Jew named Jesus was crucified for sedition. We have historical writings by Jewish writers that talk about the existence of Jesus. So we know that Jesus truly existed. We also know that He was truly killed. And we know that because nobody ever survived Roman crucifixion. Roman crucifixion was a method of execution, not torture. They had all kinds of ways to torture you, but crucifixion was not one of them. The Roman success rate with crucifixion was 100%. No one ever survived crucifixion. And then the third thing, the third issue, the third statement that we have to look at is that the Bible records that three days later Jesus came back to life. Now, if we are to believe this claim, we need some kind of proof. And so here's the chain of faith and facts that lead us to the belief that He was resurrected. Stone number one, let's call them stones, shall we? So, you know, we're crossing the, from disbelief to belief. Stone number one, the empty grave. Three days later, the Bible says, he was gone. In Matthew 27, 62 to 66, Matthew tells us that the grave was heavily guarded by both Roman and Jewish guards. There was a large stone in front of the entrance and an official seal to prevent any tampering with the body. 
Now, let's remember that Jesus was an important prisoner, one who predicted that he would resurrect from the dead, and so it was up to the Romans and especially the Jewish leaders' advantage to guard this spot against intruders. Remember, what they wanted to do was put an end to this stuff. No more of this Jesus stuff, no more of this, these followers of Jesus. You know, that we, we managed to get him killed, now he's you know, sealed away in a tomb and eventually people are just going to forget about this, things are going to go back to normal. So it was to their advantage to guard this spot. Well in John chapter 20 verses 1 and 2, John tells us that the grave was empty and the, the officials guarding it were not denying that this was true. So you have a man who was very publicly executed whose burial was supervised and whose grave was sealed and guarded by two different groups. And this person is now gone, leaving behind an empty grave. Now, if that was the only stone, it's still a stretch to get to the other side. It's only the first stone. It isn't all the evidence. It's just the first piece of evidence. The second stone is the, well, the missing body. Don't you know that the Romans and the Jews would have loved to find the missing body because it would have put an end to this, this talk about resurrection and the disciples of Jesus as a legitimate group. If they could find that body, if they could just come up with the body and say, here's your Jesus, the mutilated, you know, tortured, pierced body of this insurrectionist. Now here he is, here's your Jesus, dead. Don't you think they would have loved to have done this? Now you know there's only three possible explanations to account for the missing body. One, it was stolen. And the question to ask for that is, well, if it was stolen, okay, who stole it? And I mean, the Jews, they had no advantage to stealing the body. The very last thing they wanted was to uh, perpetuate this resurrection thing, and, and, and they already had a guard. The Romans also placed a guard, and they had no interest in Jewish religion and no interest in you know, continuing the trouble that this, this Jewish rabble-rouser had begun. And of course, the disciples, they were accused of stealing it in order to perpetuate the idea of the resurrection, Matthew 28, 13. But think now, the disciples ran away when he was alive. So how come they got so brave now? I mean, when he was alive, they ran away because they were afraid. They were no match for professional soldiers. And also to steal the body and lie about it, I mean, this was contrary to all of their teaching and all of their training. Why would they do such a thing? Another possible explanation of the missing body is that, well, the women, you know, they went to the wrong tomb. But the answer to that is, well, wouldn't the Romans and the Jews quickly correct this error and produce the right tomb? The apostles also went to the empty tomb. I mean, it would mean that everybody who went to the tomb went to the wrong place. Does this mean that every single person, the women, the disciples, the apostles, they all made the same mistake and it was never corrected? And then of course the third explanation, is only one that's left, is well he walked out like he said he would. This is the only other option to explain the reason that the body was missing. So once the grave was empty, no one, either Jew or Roman, of that period ever claimed to have removed the body or recovered the body. And I believe they must have searched everywhere because they could have stopped this Christian movement if they could have found the body, but they never, ever did. So that's the, you know, from the first stone, that's, that's the second stone. Where's the body, the missing body, never recovered? All right, let's add another stone. How about the 500 eyewitnesses? You know, if all we had was a missing body and nothing else, I don't know, our case you know, might seem inconclusive. But the New Testament records that there were over 500 eyewitnesses who saw and heard and were in the presence of the resurrected Jesus. 
The New Testament records 10 separate appearances of Jesus to over 500 different witnesses, and these are divided into two groups. The first group is the friendly witnesses who actually believed in Jesus and who believed in His promised resurrection. Uh, he appeared to the apostles, Matthew 28, 16. To the women, Matthew 28, 9. He uh, appeared to the disciples on the road to Emmaus in Luke chapter 24. And then of course, when 500 disciples were gathered together, that's a big crowd, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 7. Those were the friendly witnesses that talked and recorded their experience of meeting with the resurrected Lord. But then you also have unfriendly witnesses, hostile witnesses who did not believe but were convinced by the resurrection of Jesus. Actually, they're the best witnesses because they were convinced regardless of the doubt that they had. You know, there was Thomas, of course. We call him Doubting Thomas. I won't believe until I see it with my own eyes. And what happens? Jesus said, well, here I am. You know, come on, Thomas. Put your fingers in my hands. Put your hand in my side, right? And Thomas said, my Lord and my God. And then there was James, the earthly brother of Jesus, who didn't believe while Jesus was alive, but he believed after the resurrection, John chapter 7, 1 Corinthians 15. And then the best of all, Paul. Paul, who hated Christians, who was trying to destroy that faith, but was converted when? When Jesus appeared to him, Acts 9, 11. Think now, over 500 witnesses who at different times and places and situations claimed to have seen and heard the resurrected Christ. I want to tell you something. No other religious leader or prophet can produce this many eyewitnesses to support their claims. Muhammad, for example, was alone when he received the visions. Uh, Joseph Smith was alone for the uh, revelations made to him. All of these gurus and prophets and so on and so forth, usually they're alone, they're in the dark, they're by themselves. You know? We have to take just their word for it. But we have five Hundred, over 500 witnesses, and the interesting thing is they, they saw him in the daytime, they saw him at night, they saw him indoors, they saw him outdoors, there were men, there were women, there were all kinds of people, rich people, poor people, well-educated people, ordinary people, all saying the same thing. I think that puts us kind of halfway across the stream, don't you? But there's more, there's more. I, you know, when I get to that stone, I can actually see the other side. I, I might even think maybe I'll take a chance and jump over. But I don't have to because there's more stones. How about the martyrs? All kinds of people saw Jesus, but one thing united them. One thing was common. You know when I said night, day, men, women, rich, poor, so on and so forth? They were different in those ways. But there was one common thing for all of them. None of them denied, even under the threat of torture and death, the fact that they saw Jesus resurrected from the dead. And many were killed because of their witness. There is no record of anyone recanting their witness of Jesus' resurrection, even under the pain of death. There's no like famous person you know, that they write about, that the historians write about, that say, yeah, there were a lot of martyrs, but there was Joe. You know, Joe was one of the most famous, you know, and he recanted. We don't, there's no record of that. You know, people will die for ideals. You know, an atheist communist you know, will, will die for the ideal of, of democracy. He, he, he or she won't believe in God or in Jesus, but they will believe in the idea of democracy. They'll believe in the idea that men should be free. They'll believe in that ideal and they'll be ready to die for that ideal. And people will give up their lives even for false illusions, even for false religions. But nobody dies a horrible death to protect a lie that they know is a lie. Nobody does that. How about another stone? How about the gospel and acts? 
There are five written accounts of the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. And these accounts were never disputed within Christianity, and they were never successfully demonstrated as being a hoax or a lie. And don't you know so many tried? Surely, if this religion were based on a lie, somebody somewhere in the last 2,000 years would have blown the whistle. Another stone, maybe? How about the church itself? Not only has the Christian church lasted 2,000 years and become the largest religious group, but it has influenced the world for good beyond any other philosophy or religion ever, ever. Again, a religion that has done so much good for so many people for so long cannot be based on a deception. It just doesn't work that way. So was Jesus raised from the dead? Well, look at the chain of facts and faith. You start at disbelief, but then you find out that the grave was empty, like He said it would be empty. And then you see that the authorities never found His body, and yet it was important for them to do so, and they had all the resources at, at, at hand to find that body but they never found it. And over 500 eyewitnesses saw him alive, credible and legitimate witnesses. And many witnesses were persecuted and killed for their testimony, but never denied seeing Jesus alive. And we have five written eyewitness accounts which were never disputed then and can have never been discredited up to this day. As a matter of fact, the witness grows stronger and stronger as we move further and further away from it. And the greatest religious movement in its history is based on this particular event. Jesus Himself said, blessed are they who have not seen but believe. John 20, 29. You and I, we did not see the resurrection with our eyes. But like the belief in the existence of China, do you have enough proof so you can take one more step of faith to accept as true the resurrection of Jesus? I think we do. I know we do. You know, I want to show you something. Some people think that faith is like this blind leap. Did you ever hear that expression? A leap of faith. I'm just going to take a leap of faith. No facts, no proof, just, just belief. Well, brothers and sisters, that's not faith, that's stupidity. That's foolishness. God doesn't require this of us. God never, you find somewhere in the Bible where it talks about a blind leap of faith. Those words do not exist in that order in the Bible. If you understand and believe the facts, you only need to take the last step of faith by expressing your belief in repentance and in baptism. In Christianity, it isn't a leap of faith that is required, it is a step of faith. It's still faith, but it's a step of faith based on the facts and the evidence and the proof that God Himself has provided and preserved for anyone to look at. So the final step that brings us not only to the other side of believing, but also to that safe shore of salvation. Because it's not just disbelieve and believe, it's also lost and saved. So this is the final step that brings us to salvation. So I encourage you, if you haven't already, to take the final step of faith and, 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 and look at where you're at, you know, in these stones here, if you've not taken that final step of faith. This is how we are saved by faith. We take that final step of faith based on all of the information that God has given us. And if we've already taken this step of faith, then take comfort in the knowledge that your faith is not based on emotion or fiction, but it is based on glorious fact, 
on the glorious fact of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And so maybe you need to take a step of faith this evening. Maybe it's that step into the waters of baptism. Maybe the step of faith that you need to take is that step of repentance. Maybe that's your step of faith. You need to repent. You need to stop doing something that you are doing or you need to stop doing something that you've neglected to. Maybe that's the step that you need to take. Or maybe the step that you need to take is a step towards reconciliation with a brother or a sister in the church or a family member. Maybe that's the step of faith that you need to take. And maybe your step of faith is taking a step of humility and asking for prayer and acknowledging weakness, acknowledging need. Maybe that's the step, whatever step, whatever step that we need to make, God is always calling us to take it and not to wait. So if there's a step of faith in some way that you need to take, we've selected a song as is our custom, think about what I've said and if you need to step forward, please do so as we stand and as we sing our song of encouragement.